The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Closing the Treatment Gap in Acute and Chronic GVHD, Improving Post-CHT Outcomes with Innovative Targeted Approaches. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TGK 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello. I'm Zach DePhillip from Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and welcome to today's program exploring new developments in treating acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease. During the activity, I'll review the movement of newer therapies into standard protocols for managing steroid refractory disease, but also note important findings presented at recent medical congresses, including the annual ASH and TANDA meetings. We've also prepared practice aids that summarize dosing recommendations for modern therapeutics and provide guidance on where newer mechanisms will fit into practice. So please down these resources before we get started. Let's begin. So graft-versus-host disease is the main immunologic complication that happens after an allogeneic stem cell or bone marrow transplant, meaning a transplant where a patient is receiving cells from a donor. Historically, the differentiation between acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease had been made at day 100, and if there was any clinical evidence of graft-versus-host disease before day 100, that was considered acute, and if it was after day 100, that was considered chronic. But our understanding of graft-versus-host disease, the symptoms and the biology, and therefore the therapies for these diseases has really evolved over the last number of decades now, and we really appreciate that these are two distinct forms of complication. So when we're thinking about acute graft host disease, the main symptoms and organs involved are the skin, the GI tract, which could be like the lower intestines, but also the upper GI tract or the liver. And if you're seeing this typically in the earlier months after transplant. A first episode, we would consider this to be a classical acute graft host disease, but also appreciating that, you know, things don't always fit in the boxes as we have them written here. You know, sometimes patients have graft host disease that occurs a little bit later. That can be called late acute graft host disease. And sometimes you have an acute graft host disease that kind of starts to happen and then you start to see chronic symptoms and we call this an overlap symptom. Classic chronic graft host disease happens in the later months after a transplant, as you can see here, it is much more wide-reaching than just three organs. Many organs throughout the body can be affected by chronic graft-versus-host disease. When we think a little about overarching treatment guidelines for both acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease, there are many similarities. And one of the similarities is that corticosteroids are considered the standard first-line treatment. So this is borrowed from the NCCN guidelines. When you have a patient who develops acute graft-versus-host disease grade 2 to 4, so maybe a little more involved GVHD from a clinical perspective, beyond staying maybe on some of the preventative or maintenance immunosuppressive therapies, this would be a time that we might want to start systemic treatment. Similarly, here for chronic graft host disease for patients who are having kind of multi-organ disease or maybe more severe symptoms, corticosteroids also remain the standard of care. Depending on patient factors like age or comorbidities, frailty, we might not be able to start at as high of a dose as we you know, theoretically like to. If patients are responding, once again, that's great. But especially in chronic graft host disease, I think we know that most patients will ultimately need multiple lines of therapy and will need multiple agents available to us in the long-term treatment of this patient's care. And this slide is really just to show the variability in what we see clinically when you start patients on steroids. So first, a patient who may be responsive to treatment, you see the severity of the symptoms go down with the steroid treatment, and it follows a nice kind of resolution. In the middle, you can see this more variable clinical course where maybe they initially respond, and then they maybe start to flare or lose response, but they can still kind of regain that response. And you kind of see this kind of fluctuating up and down over a number of months when you're caring for these patients. And then obviously the most concerning is a situation where patients are really not responding to steroids or to therapy and multiple treatments may be needed.
So these are some of our goals for today. We want to enhance our knowledge of the evidence that supports these newer therapies and emerging therapeutic platforms for patients who have acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease. We want to equip you with the skills that you'll need to develop a personalized treatment plan for patients with GVHD. And this can be dependent on disease subtype and looking at the current evidence and practice guidelines. And finally, provide some guidance on practical aspects of care for newer therapeutic platforms with the treatment of GVHD. So in the NCCN guidelines, this is what's listed for both acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease as agents that can be used after steroids. So briefly, I'll touch on acute. A category one recommendation is ruxolitinib. This is a JAK1-2 inhibitor. That's an oral medication. Its approval in the U.S. was based on a single-arm study called REACH-1, which was further supported by a randomized study that was done in Europe called REACH-2 that compared the use of ruxolitinib to other available therapies in acute graft-versus-host disease and showed that ruxolitinib was associated with superior response. In chronic graft host disease, we actually have a few more FDA-approved drugs. So once again, we have ruxolitinib, which was supported by a randomized phase 3 trial called REACH-3. Again, comparing ruxolitinib to other available agents in chronic GVHD in patients who had failed steroid therapy. But we also have ibrutinib, which is a BTK inhibitor, as well as belimosidol, a ROC2 inhibitor, that have also received FDA approval based on single-arm studies showing good overall response rates. I think a lot of people nowadays are leaning towards the use of these FDA-approved agents, which are more targeted, but still listed here are a number of immunosuppressive therapies and other kind of more traditional therapies in chronic GVHD, which can still be very helpful for patients dealing with symptoms. So we've collected here some dosing information generalized for these three FDA-approved agents. This information will be available for you for download in the practice aid, but just kind of highlighting some key points regarding the FDA indications and the recommended dosing. So belimosidol is a ROC2 inhibitor. The recommended dose is 200 milligrams once a day, but there are dose adjustments for other concurrent medications that the patients may be on. Abrutinib is also FDA-approved in chronic GVHD. The indication is failure of at least one line of systemic therapy, and this has been done in adults, but also pediatrics all the way down to the age of one. The dose in adults is 420 milligrams, and in the younger pediatric population, it is at a lower dose based on the child's size. And finally, ruxolitinib, as we mentioned before, FDA approved for both acute and chronic graft host disease. The starting doses are slightly different, though I will note here that the recommendation in acute GVHD is that after being on this 5 milligram dose twice a day for three days, that is okay to increase the dose to the 10 milligram dose, which is the recommended dose in chronic GVHD. This was a updated abstract that was recently presented at ASH. It's the long-term follow-up of that randomized REACH-3 study, which compared ruxolitinib to other available therapies. And I think the main take-home from this slide is just showing the long-lasting benefit that patients seem to be receiving with ruxolitinib in chronic GVHD. So when you look here at failure-free survival, which is looking at are the patients still on treatment with ruxolitinib and have they not needed a change of treatment? Have they not experienced relapse of their underlying disease and have they not run into any fatal events? You can see here that the patients who are on ruxolitinib in the black line have a far higher median failure-free survival as compared to the patients who were treated with other agents. But we kind of want to shift today's focus on a new medication called axitilimab, which targets the CSF1 receptor and has become a very exciting new development in the setting of chronic graft-versus-host disease. So the CSF1 receptor is a target that is identified on monocytes and macrophages, and it contributes to potentially both inflammation and fibrosis in the development of chronic graft-versus-host disease. Axitilimab is a monoclonal antibody that targets the CSF1 receptor, and in doing so is very promising in that it may be able to address both types of manifestations of chronic graft-versus-host disease that we see in patients, which could give it a lot of utility in our heavily pretreated patient population. So Agave 201 was a large phase two open-label multicenter 
study that had sites both in the U.S. but also across the globe. It enrolled patients with recurrent or refractory chronic GVHD, and it randomized these participants to one of three doses with axitilumab, either the 0.3 milligram per kilogram every two-week dose, a one milligram per kilogram every two-week dose, and a three milligram per kilogram every four-week dose. The key eligibility criteria were that these were either children or adults who had received at least two lines of systemic therapy, and they had active chronic GVHD when they were enrolled. They were allowed to be on steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, or mTOR inhibitors while receiving axitilumab, but they couldn't be on other agents like ruxolitinib or belomocetol. The primary endpoint was overall response rates within the first six cycles of treatment, so this shows here the overall response rate in the first six cycles for these three doses. All three of the doses met the primary endpoint of response, but as shown here, the highest response rates were in this lowest dose cohort of 0.3 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. This is a little bit of an unexpected finding. Typically, you think as the dose increases that the efficacy of the medication would increase, but we actually kind of saw the opposite here. And this is something that's still kind of under investigation, and there's some preclinical models that are being developed to better understand the kinetics of this medication from a biological perspective in the light of these findings. But now we're focusing on that low dose 0.3 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. This is a plot showing some important subgroups based on patient characteristics or GVHD characteristics to try to identify are there any subgroups that seem to respond better to axitilumab or vice versa, maybe any that seem not to benefit from axitilumab. And in that setting, it's shown here that the drug really maintained its efficacy across all these subgroups. So whether you were looking at the number of lines of therapy that a participant had received, whether they had received certain specific FDA-approved medications or their overall chronic GVHD severity or the number of organs involved, axitilumab continued to show good response in these participants. When we look at organ-specific response rates in this low-dose cohort, you can see responses across all the organs. It was very encouraging that we saw responses in fibrosis-dominated organs, especially the lungs, which historically is a very difficult organ to see more substantial response in. The skin responses are low, 27%. And just to provide a little context around that, this is partly reflective of the fact that the response criteria for skin are sometimes hard to meet. It's a very high threshold. And then also a lot of the patients on this trial had sclerotic disease, which is also sometimes harder to get a NIH criteria of response in. But shown here, there are some secondary measures that suggest that patients might be benefiting from axitilumab in terms of their skin. 66% had improvement in skin and joint tightening, and also 44% had a reduction in the amount of skin area that was involved by sclerosis. Here we're showing improvement in symptom burden as measured by the least symptom scale. So 55% of the participants experienced a clinically meaningful improvement in their symptoms. Interestingly, that time to improvement was one and a half months. That was also the median time to clinical response. So it suggests to me that often when a patient was achieving a clinical response, that they also felt like they were getting better as well, which is obviously very important. Finally, this is just an overview of some of the safety about this low-dose arm. So as you would kind of expect, most patients while receiving treatment developed at least some form of an adverse event while on treatment. Most of that was reflective of what we see in chronic GVHD patients. So, you know, fatigue, headache, diarrhea, nausea, but it was much more rare that a patient developed an adverse event that would actually make them stop axitilumab. That only happened in 6% of the participants. 18% of the participants participants in this low-dose arm experienced a adverse event that was thought to be treatment-related with pneumonia, colitis, and hypertension being the only ones that occurred in multiple patients. And then finally, we're not showing it here, but when you compare it to the higher-dose arms, the higher-dose arms were associated with a higher rate of adverse events. So there seemed to be a dose dependency with the best safety profile being seen in this low-dose cohort. So some conclusions about this Agave 201 study, axitilumab at 0.3 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks is highly effective and has a manageable safety profile. It was associated with rapid and durable responses in all organs and patient subgroups, and there was a significant reduction in symptom burden in most patients, including those with fibrosis. The treatment-related adverse events were mostly low-grade and reversible, and there were no new safety concerns with the drug, and it really potentially puts axitilumab in a unique space. You have a different mechanism of action compared to our other 
FDA approved agents in chronic GVHD, and we have a drug that's able to show clinical responses even after standard of care drugs have been used. So Agave 201 was a registrational trial. We do not know yet if it will receive FDA approval, but the results from the trial are very promising. So what are some other considerations of thinking about how to compare and contrast axitilmab to these other drugs? We are a little bit limited because we don't have head-to-head -head trials. So when you're thinking about toxicities with axitilmab, one thing to keep in mind is that there is an expected rise in the liver function test that can happen after infusions. This is expected based on the on-target effect of axitilmab on Kufr cells in the liver. It's not indicative of liver injury. It just slows the clearance of these enzymes. So you you'll see them go up on the labs. I think there's very compelling data for the Gave 201 that axitilimab can help patients who have advanced fibrosis or lung disease. This is something that was seen in a secondary analysis with belomocidol, as well as a separate phase two study with ruxolitinib for lung disease. So those are some considerations there. We don't know ultimately what an FDA label may look like for axitilimab, but there were pediatric patients that were treated on the Agave 201 study. So if it does receive FDA approval, it's not a huge jump to think that it would be available for pediatric patients. And then the last piece is route of administration. So one thing about axitilimab is that it's an IV infusion. That's a little bit different than what we've seen with some of these other oral medications. And that will be a consideration when talking to patients about the convenience of administration and which patients may want to initially start on an oral medication and at what threshold will they want to start an IV medication. So in conclusion, GVHD is the major immunological complication for allogeneic transplant recipients. We now have multiple FDA-approved agents that have expanded the treatment landscape for chronic GVHD, and novel therapies focused on high-risk disease manifestations such as fibrosis and lung involvement bring promise for continued improvement in outcomes. That concludes our exploration of new developments in the treatment of chronic GVHD. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TGK 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Insight Corporation.